welcome everybody. We're about to do some worship songs for y'all. You're welcome to stand or sit or whatever feels most comfortable for you. Thanks for coming out. Suffering is unknown. Each tear that falls is holy. Each breaking heart a throne that is a song of beauty in every weeping eye for the His heart it breaks with mine. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. da 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 da
we had sought the truth then we felt the pain even wandered beyond our faith in the name we cannot pretend we are always okay we cannot depend on fast food grace help me let you go help me give up control of the god i have made you when my fear has contained you help me let you go help me give up control of the god i have made you when my fear has contained you different by far than our broken conclusions you are not the god my pain has conceived you are deeper and stronger than my eyes can see let me let you go help me give up control of the god i have made you when my fear has contained you help me let you go help me give up control of the god i have made you when my fear has contained you This cannot stay the same. So come complete me with your love, Lord. I want to hear the words you have to say. Cause you are real, Lord. You're moving in this room now. As I open up and let can feel you draw me and completing me it's hard for me to be loving but I feel empty when it's gone so come complete me with your love, Lord, cause it can heal the hardest hearts. Will you heal mine for a start? Cause you are real now. As I open. 
open up and let it go again. I can feel you drawing me. I'm completing me. You're completing me. You're completing me. You're completing me. And you would never leave as you would be real now. You are moving in this room now. As I open up and let it go again, I can feel you draw near. drawing near cause you are always drawing near and completing me and completing me thanks y'all Brian's going to do some announcements for us so you're free to sit down Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Graham. Um, I work with the middle school and high schoolers here at the Commons and uh, Trinity Heights and Church of the Epiphany. We have the Flagstaff Youth Co-op. Um, that's my role. So I'm going to give you guys some announcements before we get going. So um, welcome to the Commons. If you don't know, that's where you are. And um, tomorrow and every Monday at 5.30 at the Southfields at NAU, a group of us will be playing sand volleyball. So... Um, if you haven't gone, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Daniel's really good. He plays a lot. Eli goes sometimes, too. Um, yeah, but it's really fun. You don't have to be an expert to play. You could be pretty bad and get better. It's just a lot of fun. So I highly recommend going and playing with us. Next, we have a dinner social for everyone 50 years and older, Saturday, May 21st at 5 p.m. at Greg and Susie Miller's house. So... There's the number if you're interested. So you can call that number or text that number to RSVP or ask them questions. Okay, in a couple weeks, we have another thing coming up called the Q. Um, if you haven't ever been to a Q, it's really awesome. It's basically ask any questions you want. Um, Charlie, is uh, he hosts it, and he just has a breadth of knowledge and is willing to take risks and answer questions no matter how hard they are. So it's a really fun time. Um, that's going to be Wednesday, May 25th at 7 p.m. at the Downtown Commons office, which is above Aloha Bar Barbecue, if you guys have ever been down there, next to Flag Brew. All right. And then June 12th, Sunday, June 12th, instead of church, we're going to be hanging out together at Lake Mary, 4 p.m. Um, looks like bring your own stuff, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you want to bring floaties or paddle boards or kayaks, water guns, I mean, the list just goes on, chairs, blankets, so yeah, all that stuff. And then I just have a couple um, announcements because we have a summer camp coming up for our middle school and high school students. Um, if anyone here is in middle school and high school, I don't know if they are, but if you are and you're interested, um, talk to me. I can get you hooked up with a registration packet and everything you need to sign to go. Um, basically, it's per student is $240. We just need a $50 registration fee. Um, we have some money already set aside for scholarships. We are doing some fundraising. Um, so if you or anyone you know wants to go, uh, don't let money be a reason that they can't go. We will make it happen. But that is going to be June 27th to the 29th, and it's in Prescott at a camp called Chapel Rock. We have a lot of fun. We eat a lot of meals together. We play a ton of games, and um, last time everyone just slept the whole ride home, so we go hard, and it's a lot of fun. It's a Monday through Wednesday, June 27th to 29th, so hopefully it'll be a fun little boost after summer settles in for the students. And also, one of the things we're doing to raise money is someone donated hoverboards to us. 
brand new. These ones are really nice ones. Um, so if you want to step into the future and float across the ground, we have hoverboards. Um, five dollars a ticket, so every five dollars gets your name in the raffle. And on May 25th, I'm going to draw a name, and whatever name I draw gets that hoverboard. All the money we raise is going towards scholarships. So um, whatever money we have left over after this camp, if we still have scholarship money left, we're just going to put it into the next camp or the next event. So talk to me if you are interested in buying some of those tickets. And we could do cash, we could do Venmo, check. So I'll be hanging around today. If you are interested in buying some of those, let me know. I would like to bring up our fun guest. Hey guys, my name is Jess. I'm over the Commons College Ministry here. Um, if you'd like to, please stand with me as we unite our breath and read the Lord's Prayer out loud together. This is found in Matthew chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, let your holy name be known. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today the bread that we need and forgive us our wrongs as we forgive those who have done wrong to us. Do not lead us into trial, but save us from evil. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, and thank all of you for being here today. In fact, I'm, I'm quite aware that um, Game 7 and the Phoenix Suns are playing right now. And so those of you that are here, you get extra stars in heaven, or you hate basketball or something like that. But we're very, very glad you're with us. Um, Kyle and Greta are in Paris for their 10-year anniversary, so I'm thankful for Sierra leading music and Brian Graham doing announcements. I don't think... In my memory, I've ever been so compelled or engrossed in the announcements as when Brian Graham started listing off the things that we could bring to the lake. A blanket, <laughs> towel, food. I was back there like, I don't think I need to give a sermon today. I was, I was enthralled with what you were saying. The greatest announcements of all time. We really, truly, if you're visiting today, we hope you feel very, very welcome here. Um, no matter who you are, we're a diverse community of people who have a lot of different backgrounds and faith, and we hope that this uh, feels very safe for all of you. We have a tradition of always praying for another church in town. We've done that for the 12 years that we've existed, um, but now we're, gonna, we're not going to pray for another church in town. Every once in a while, when something happens uh, around the world, we like to pray for those that are hurting, and I'm sure, hopefully, some of you are aware of the horrible shooting that happened in Buffalo, New York, uh, late yesterday, and um, I thought we should join our hearts in prayer for our siblings that meet in Buffalo um, after a hate crime has taken place. Uh, racially motivated, a white supremacist, 18-year-old shot and killed 10 people targeting African Americans. And so I thought that part of the gift of being a church is that we sometimes sit in solidarity with those that are hurting and we join our hearts with them in, in Buffalo. So if you're the praying type, join me and we're going to lift them up. Lord, we often um, don't know what to say, and I'm thankful for prayer in those moments, Lord, and we can just bring our presence before you, um, and Lord, we just pray for our siblings in Buffalo and uh, the churches that meet there, but the whole community in general, Lord. Let them know that you are a God who co-suffers with us, and that in the pain of violence and hatred and racism, things for which we need a word like sin. God, I pray that your presence will be known. Let them know that there are hearts around this world uh, beating with theirs and feeling uh, love. Let them feel that solidarity. Um, we love them, and we pray that your voice of love and grace and strength and truth and hope and prophetic vision will rise out of this as we continue to try to hope for a better world. Um, we thank you for your grace and love, and we just brokenhearted lay them at your feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I like to start um, with a little bit more humorous story or something like that, but I did want to, before I transition to the series we're in, just say a couple words about the relationship of the church and white supremacy. Um, I think that one of the greatest dangers that exists on this planet 
is this evil ideology of white supremacy. And the reason I'm talking about it at church, I saw people this morning uh, online mad that their church brought this up one way or the other because they thought it was divisive. <laughs> and I, 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 my blood boils a little bit when that happens because what's divisive is if a church community or a local community or any organization allows a sinful, evil ideology to take root in such a way that someone's mind can be so twisted that they hate someone because they are a Jew or because they are black or because they are LGBTQ or because they are anything fill in the blank. There cannot be any ideology farther from the truth of Christ, the reason we gather together. And I think what's hard for me is knowing, especially as a white male pastor and being involved for church in a long time, that church has been a safe place for the ideology of white supremacy. The roots of colonialism, a lot of the academic work that I was very privileged to go through was understanding the way in which this ideology has shaped systems, has shaped economics, has been part of the sleeping serpent underneath our country. And this one act of hatred for me is just another example of an extremist doing something very hateful, but it's, a, it's also the result of centuries of colonialism and a compromise within the church to ever let this cancerous sin come into our midst. And so I think it's important when something like this happens. It's not comfortable, it's not fun. I don't wanna cause division, but I do wanna call out, one of the things I think church is for, we're in a series called Why Church. One of the things church is for is to speak truth and to have discernment. And sometimes things just need to be said clearly. And, and sometimes I think the church has done a really bad job with language like sin and has used it to shame people or control people, when really the beautiful word of sin is this prophetic sword to speak truth to things like violence and racism and say, we are better than this as human beings, as followers of Christ. And so I think it's important to just recognize that and speak to that a little bit. As uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as it might be, I think it's also an opportunity for us to think a little bit in our heart about how do we love. I, I don't think many of you in here are, are white supremacists in your personal individual experience of life, no matter what race or background you come from, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't affect all of us in the, in the way we exist in the world. And so I just wanna encourage us to do the work, uh, to read, listen, follow the voices of the great leaders of the people of color in our own faith and outside of our faith who teach us what the experience is like. I personally have no idea what that's like to fear going to the grocery store just because I'm in a majority black neighborhood. And there's always the possibility that some racist is gonna come in with an assault rifle and kill my children. I honestly don't know what that feels like. And I want us to at least for a moment in our hearts, try to feel that pain and be a part of um, a, a universal movement to change the world. I do believe what Martin Luther King Jr. said, that we're in a great moral arc that's a trajectory towards more justice, and that's gonna be one of the things we're gonna talk about in this particular series that we're talking about, but it takes hard work. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just fall in our laps. The forward march of progress is not something that isn't driven by the will of human beings who are willing to have hard conversations and, and make change. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna live on that. I know it's a heavy place to start, but I think it's important when we have these real reminders that happen that this is a real world with real hatred and real evil and real sin. Let's call it what it is and let's make sure that we're never a place that harbors anything that's that kind of ideology and we speak truth to it. So I wanted to share that to begin our time and hopefully transition a little bit because I do believe this is one of the reasons church exists. It's not the most fun thing to think about. It's not how the big mega churches explode around the world. It's not the thing that really draws people together to talk about hard grading society issues, but one aspect of why we do church is so that we don't just read a headline or hear a news story and then just move on to the next thing, that we have this family or this space where we can come together when something's hard and we can kind of wrestle with it a little bit and we can kind of sharpen and grow and stretch and heal and maybe even be inspired for, for great change. It's one of the reasons we do church. And that's actually what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. We're in this discussion, we're in this series about why do we even do this? Because as a leadership team, especially coming off of one of the most extraordinary times in human history of COVID, 
and a lot of people realizing, I don't even know if I wanna go back to church. One of our great questions is why do we even do this? And that's why last year and this year, we're looking at these five kind of concrete pillars of why we as a leadership of the commons think that we still think it's a beautiful, holy, organic, life-giving experience to gather together. Not just to gather together on Sundays, but to do life together. And those five things that we've been talking about, we're in the middle of the series, are first of all, community is what we talked about first. Community, real, authentic community. And then last week we talked about spiritual connection, talking about loving God and being loved by God and how we do that in practice. And today we're gonna talk about this element of church called service and kind of look at it from different angles and what that means. And in the next couple, few weeks, we're gonna be looking at also justice and inclusion. Those are the five things that we're looking at. And today when we talk about service, this is one that I'm really intrigued by because in in my experience over the last few decades, um, I'm always curious of the things that stand out for people who claim that in some way they follow the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And over my lifetime, I've experienced, like many of you, probably very diverse expressions of the faith, and I'm also really active and love being in the interfaith community and interacting here in town with our Jewish leaders and our Islamic leaders and our Hindu leaders, and I love religious dialogue. But one of the things that I've always been intrigued with my whole life since I was little is that is there a difference? Are there people out there who say they follow Jesus, and one thing that you notice about their life is that they live a life of service? You know, sometimes, I think sometimes I'm probably a little too critical, to be honest with you, of the American church. I think we do need to call out some of the mistakes of what has happened with the American Christian religion, but there's also times where it gets it right, and to be honest with you, in my life, I have experienced a lot of different churches in America, and I seem to always find people who want to serve other people in those communities, and I find it extraordinarily attractive. In fact, I find it to be very, very countercultural, and, and dare I say even radical, given the kind of sort of capitalist, individualist, competitive, winner-take-all society of corporations and the NFL and the NBA and all of the things that kind of shape our unconscious culture, it seems kind of radical to me that there's this other undercurrent. There's these people who are out there trying to serve. They're trying to like make someone else's life better than their own life. I wonder if you've seen that too. When I think back on my own life, I think some of the heroes that I've seen are the people who exhibit exactly this thing. They have this ability to serve other people in such a way that it actually makes me think about God. Think think about that. Have you ever in your life known someone that their way of being in the world is so service-oriented for other people? And it comes from this security, not this sort of self-deprecating doormat type personality, but this humble strength and security that pours love into other people's lives so that when you see the way they exist in the world, it makes you think of God. I can think of people right now in my head that I go, wow, I wanna, I wanna be like that. And throughout this series, what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on, as an anchor, moments in the life of Christ because we believe as we look at the whole library of text that is the Bible, those 66 books and all of their genres, we do have a sort of Christocentric approach of looking through the life of Jesus of Nazareth to say, what did Jesus actually teach us about service? And there's two pretty obvious scriptures that I want us to read together to start our conversation when we think about the idea of service, especially in the context of community. And I wanted to start, first of all, with Matthew chapter, I believe, 20. Oh, I think I marked my book wrong. Here it is, yeah, Matthew chapter 20. And there's a situation where some of the friends of Jesus, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, men and women, children, this group of people that followed around this compelling rabbi 2,000 years ago, there was some sort of weird kind of normal human argument about who was gonna be the greatest when Jesus came into power. And the reason that is is because they had a massive misunderstanding as we talk about all the time. They believed Jesus was either gonna be a political hero and he would run for president, AKA be the king of the Jews or something like that, or some sort of violent war hero that was gonna overthrow Rome, although Jesus had a completely different sort of kingdom in mind. And so when they were arguing, thinking that he was gonna be powerful about who would be the greatest among his followers with him, Jesus had a very poignant conversation found in Matthew chapter 20. It says, you know, this is verse 25, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. 
Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, is what the NIV says. That's doulon in the Greek, which is probably more like bond servant. It was like an exchange system they had back then. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The reason I wanted to start here is this is kind of an obvious passage when you think about Jesus teaching on service, but I really liked how Jesus uses a contrast here. He, he contrasts the way that the rest of the world exists, and he says the Gentiles, which is just his kind of um, slang for people who are not Jewish at the time, those that are not part of our way of being, he's saying the way they do it is that they rule over people. And the reason I love that is because this is very applicable to what I referenced earlier. The way of the whole world is not rooted in selfless servantness. The thing that we're drawn to is red carpet, super fake, attractive fame, or giant money and yachts and buying of Twitter or whatever it is. We're drawn to this different way of being in the world that's driven by power dynamics. It's driven by who's the most strong or powerful or can put other people down. And even if we don't share those virtues, you have to admit, because I don't think that I'm drawn towards those things, and yet I'm still clicking and reading about all the famous people. There's something in me that's still drawn to the rich, the powerful, the attractive, and it's this whole upside-down kingdom that Jesus was challenging 2,000 years ago. It still exists today, and he's saying what they do is they lord it over each other, and he says, not with you, though. If you want to be the greatest, you must become the least. This is that sort of counterintuitive thinking that we call the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be the greatest, you must be the servant. By the way, I love just reading these simple scriptures like this that I've been reading since I was a little boy and just remembering how attractive the teachings of Jesus were. I think sometimes we're used to it. If, if you're like me and you grew up around religion, you've probably heard this verse I don't know how many times in your life, but hear it again for the first time. It's an amazing teaching to challenge the whole power structure of the way the world works and say, no, 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 no. If you want to be the greatest, be the last one doing the dishes. If you want to be the greatest, you be the one that shows up first with a casserole when someone's hurting. If you want to be the greatest, you be the one that leads the trash cleanup, or you be the one that lobbies for climate change, or you be the one who serves with your life in such a way that there's something that makes your life so significant that it actually changes the world. And I hope you notice something there. I wanted to link together the simplicity of washing dishes and making casseroles and fighting for climate justice or racial justice because all of it is service all of it is holy, all of it drifts with the divine. Because service at its core, in its goodness, is rooted in deep, fearless love. Service at its core is rooted in deep, fearless love. I think of, uh, it's not just about washing dishes or cleaning carpet or doing those things. I think of the, the John Brown. He was an abolitionist that was a part of bloody Kansas before the Civil War. And then he led a, a failed attempt at, at trying to end slavery at Harper's Ferry that most historians would say was the beginning of the Civil War. And he did that because he was at church one day and he heard a sermon about service and about the golden rule, loving others as you love themselves. And he was a white man and he literally stood up in church and said, I will give my life radically. He just stood up and interrupted church like if one of you right now stood up and just interrupted and said, I will give my life to end slavery. And he did exactly that. He started what the Union Army ultimately finished. And he did it because he believed that Christ did not care about the color of skin or economic systems or if cotton was the industry of the world. He didn't care about any of that. And John Brown was hated because he was a threat to white supremacy. And they hung him. And he gave his life to start something that ultimately was the beginning of abolishment of slavery. That too is service. Service is a complex big thing. And the one thing that I've been hoping to do in this whole series, and if you remember back two weeks ago, is to talk about this concept of near enemies. And this is actually a Buddhist concept, but it was something I, I saw Brene Brown talking about, and I thought it would be a really neat tool for us as we have conversation about the pillars of our church. So in that first week, I was explaining to you that the Buddhist idea of a near enemy is saying that sometimes when we think about how something is the opposite of something else, it distracts us from the real enemy. For instance, if we think that the opposite of love is hate, the enemy, we might miss out that the more dangerous thing is the, is the near enemy of pity. So hate is obviously bad, but often if we're thinking of the opposite of love or compassion, 
the near enemy of pity is even worse because you feel like you're loving, but you're putting yourself on a power dynamic and you're doing something that could be more nefarious and dark by pitying other people, thinking you're better than them, and then your actions can be blindingly bad in such a way. And I didn't even talk about it, but last week when we were talking about spiritual connection, you could think the opposite of spiritual connection is, is atheism or something like that, but I think the near enemy of spiritual connection is religion. It's religiosity. It's rules and structure and trying to control or put God in a box. Then you're actually missing out on deep, rich, spiritual connection with God. So what is the near enemy when we talk about service? And I think it's a, it's a thin veil. And I'm not sure there's even one word to sum it up. But when I think about the near enemy of service, the first thing that pops in my mind comes from Matthew chapter 6, I believe. Jesus is talking about giving here, and he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. I, I, I always point this out every time I come across Jesus talking about hypocrites, but hypocrite is just an English word we're used to, but most Linguistic scholars believe Jesus was the first person to use, hypocrite in the Greek, it's a Greek word, hypocritus, is an actor. And Jesus was in this town, the Decapolis, that had a, a Greek and a Roman amphitheater, and there was actors around called hypocrites. They were actors. And so Jesus was saying, don't be an, an actor or a fake or a phony or inauthentic. He said, that's what they do. They, they, they do it in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, You've received their, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So for me, when I read this section of the Sermon on the Mount, I, I can get the impression that with the, the near enemy of service is performance. It's this selfish act so people can see how good you are. Jesus is saying, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When you are moved by fearless love, when compassion for others and service is, is the beating blood in your veins, you don't go perform so that other people can see what a great server you are. And, and again, I wanna be encouraging. I've seen this in my life so much. I've seen churches filled with people who serve not to be seen by others. Here's the problem though. Sometimes we don't think a little deeper about how our actual systems work. And we're a part of a history of churches that try to do good. I'm sure many of you have heard of the, the book When Helping Hurts, but there's a whole world of scholarship understanding that people with good intentions go in and try to serve a community and what they end up doing is causing more harm than good. Sometimes it's because it's performative. Sometimes it's, it's even more nefarious than that. Sometimes it's transactional. Sometimes Christians have gone into other countries, and all religions have done this, but Christians certainly have gone into other countries and served and built water wells transactionally so that if I do this for you, then you'll ask Jesus into your heart and you'll add to our numbers and we'll have a bigger group of Christians because we served you and we tricked you into or manipulated to be a part of our religion. This is real bad, and it has destroyed continents and it destroyed indigenous cultures. It's ravaged North America and indigenous cultures. It's ravaged Asia, it's ravaged Africa. This idea of colonialism is the near enemy of service. Service has to come from a deeper, purer, more authentic, spiritually connected source. One of the things I love about talking about these five ideas is how interconnected all of them are. When you live in healthy community, and you have real spiritual connection with God's unconditional love, and you experience authentic, non-performative service because you want justice and inclusion, a big table at the kingdom of heaven. These five things work together in such an interconnected way that the health kind of spreads in the same way sometimes dishealth or cancerous things spread. So what I want us to encourage you to think about is, is sort of a, a so what? Why, why does this matter for us as we look at this particular pillar of the church? Sometimes, if you're like me, and you've been around a lot of performative, showy Christianity that has probably had the most capitalistic success in numbers in this country, we forget the real stuff. We forget the people behind the scenes whose heart is just beating to love other people in deep, true, authentic service. 
You know, I went to, uh, I wasn't planning on telling this, but I, I'm just picturing in my mind, I went to Peru on a mission trip when I was probably 19 with some sort of organization that I won't say the name of. And I remember showing up in these tiny villages in Trujillo, Peru, on the west side of the Andes and all this desert sand dunes with like starving children. And, and as a 19 year old idealistic Christian kid wearing t-shirts, wanting to go serve the poor, I remember thinking we're gonna go and, and I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna go on this mission trip, I'm gonna serve. And when we got there, I was blown away by the poverty as, as an entitled American. I, I didn't even know that sort of malnutrition in children and poverty existed as it does in many places in the world. And I thought, okay, now we're here. And you know what we did? The, the leader of our group brought a karaoke machine and he went to local churches and he and his wife sang songs at the churches and then we left. And I was like, what just happened? There's children starving right over here and you came to somehow support your ego or to build your name or something or to be a part of something so dark and creepy I can't even understand. That's not the kind of service that draws us deep into each other's connection and presence and authenticity. But I also got to go to Haiti with Misty Sinna from our community and Life on Psalm and watch them in Cap Rouge, Haiti, also some of the most poverty I've ever seen, empower and educate women and listen to local leaders to see what they want and then pour the resources of love and kindness into planting plants and developing a, a led by indigenous people medical center so that lives were saved and a whole community is transformed because service doesn't have to be performative. It doesn't have to be selfish. It can actually be very empowering and it can be the very love of Christ and Christ's resurrection happening over and over and over again. So here's the question. How do we become a part of that? How do we taste that in our own community? Thank God, a lot of those people that I think of that have been heroes to me are sitting in this room right now or have sat in this room over the last 12 years. I've watched so many of you pour your life out serving our immigrant food share program or dreaming up the immigrant food share program. I watched three college girls years ago come up to me after church and decide they wanted to do something about homelessness and they partnered together with all the churches in town and they started an organization using church buildings to be an overflow shelter for those that were freezing to death at night. And then it spread to all the church community around this town and I thought, that's Christ, that's resurrection, that's life, it's happening again. And I've watched my wife and a lot of people who've served with Sage Home for a long haul, build an organization to help substance abuse moms stay with their babies so they can form attachment and have hope in a life. And I could go on and on and on about how many of you have poured out your life in service, not only for what happens here on Sunday, but for these programs or going and helping in life on Psalm or Jubilee Prom the other night was probably one of the most holy things I've ever been to in my life. To watch Olivia and all these leaders pour their life into these students with disabilities to give them a special prom, I will never be the same from just sitting there taking pictures all night. Service is holy. Service is holy. And we need it. Psychoanalytically, your brain needs it. And why is that? It's because you and I need to be significant. One of the most important things of our development as a human as we mature from children into adulthood is to be people of significance who make a difference in the world. And the way to do that is through loving, fearless service. And that often spills into justice and inclusion and community and spiritual connection. So I want you to think about today in a conversation as we come to the communion table, how can you be a part of that? What can you dream up and invite other people into? Or what can you jump into that already exists so that you can taste a little bit of that holy thing that I actually think is sort of the electricity that has made this church movement explode for 2,000 years? This is not new. People have been following this radical idea of Jesus for a long time. And anytime people serve like that, it grows. And it's like a tree, a plant, a growth that's something that's exciting to be a part of. I'm gonna invite us to the communion table to have a conversation about that. And um, as we've scheduled out our church calendar, next week is gonna be a service project to follow up this conversation. So we will meet here next week, and then we're gonna go serve, cleaning up, um, probably trash. I'm not exactly sure what all we're gonna be doing, but be here, show up, we're gonna serve together, we're gonna party together, and hopefully that'll just be a, also a performative sacrament and practice to serve alongside each other next week. Uh, let me pray for us, and if you've never been here, we have an open communion table or sacrament. We also have 
COVID-friendly little plastic containers, and then we also have the, the wine and the grape juice to dip into if you feel comfortable. Either one is fine. Uh, we have an open table. All are welcome, and uh, also optional. You shouldn't feel compelled, but you're welcome to, to participate as we take Christ in us and as we think about this particular piece of service and significance. Let me pray. God, we love you, and we're thankful when we see you and other people who, uh, for, for no glory whatsoever, behind the scenes serve. We also thank you for those who lay down their life in service, even if it make them look bad or they're killed or persecuted or hated. Service comes in so many different flavors, Lord, but I pray that our conversation with you today can be on our hearts and fearless love, and truly wanting health and human flourishing for all, especially those that are marginalized and less privileged and hurting, Lord, as you have called us and pointed us all uh, to serve in that way. Inspire us, Lord, put your spirit in us, move in your holy wind and love that our hearts would become a flame uh, with a passion to serve. And we remember at the communion table that your service, like John Brown's, ended in death, Lord, that not only were you willing to live for this message, you were willing to die for the message. Um, as Frederick Douglass said of John Brown, Lord, and as we remember of you, a way of being that is completely service-oriented, that you came not to be served, but to serve. And we remember your body broken, your blood spilt, and as we receive these elements into our bodies today, we thank you for our bodies we thank you for your love and we receive your forgiveness. Lord, forgive us individually and especially with our heavy hearts today. Forgive us corporately, systemically for these evils and sins and change us, change our minds and bring us to repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. that our hearts are made for. I promise you they do. Birch trees are bones stripped of their leaves and pressed between to pretend It's not easy to pretend It's not easy to pretend I can see blue skies again Suddenly I can see blue skies say there's nothing less that our hearts will mend. I promise you they do. Y'all
want to stay with us, we're going to do just like two of the last songs um, for worship this evening. Repeat that one more time for two more times. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks. Compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. He blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks passion on this world yours are the feet with which he walks to do good yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world yours are the hands we're gonna do a doxology real quick most people should know this by now, and every kind of church does it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Well, I hope that you will, if you're free tonight and you want to continue to hang out. We're going to go, uh, anyone that wants to, down to Fratelli's, just down the street, because they will have the game on. I did peek at the score, but I will not say what the score is, because I know the code, and I would not do that to any of you who care deeply. And if you know the score, keep it to yourself until you get down to the game. And I also want to remind you that the blood moon is happening tonight. Everyone knows about the blood moon, right? If you don't, don't raise your hand and be embarrassed. You should know. But at, uh, I think, 9-11 is the peak tonight of the lunar eclipse where the full moon will be completely red. If you haven't watched those in Flagstaff, I watch them every single time. I'll get up at 4 in the morning because they're so beautiful and clear here. But this one's unique because you don't have to get up at 4 in the morning. 
I'm actually thinking about going to Lowell Observatory. It does cost money up there. I think it's $15 for local adults, $10 for kids. But they're having a party up there, and they'll have telescopes and astronomers talking about the blood moon. So I might go up there later after we go to Fratelli's. But make sure you don't miss that. If you just go home and go to bed, at least go outside at 9-11 and check out the red moon. And remember that Christopher Columbus once told an indigenous tribe that he would turn the moon red if they didn't give them all their belongings because he knew about the eclipse, and then he murdered the whole tribe. May that bless you as you leave today and we talk about colonialism. Please don't celebrate Columbus Day, but th this is not the day to fight that battle. I don't know what I'm doing right now. I'm out of control. <laughs> he was a really, really terrible guy, though. Let's go to Fratelli's. <laughs> Let me pray for us, and we'll go be together. God, we love you so much, Lord, and we are thankful that the sky is filled with mystery and wonder. We're thankful, Lord, as an ancient Near Eastern singer, songwriter said, day and night the sky pours forth speech, and as we watch the shadow of our earth tonight, uh, wow us with a red moon. Let us be reminded of this whole creative universe. And Lord, draw us in our hearts into service and connection, and let us be bonded one to the other in your love. In Jesus' name, amen.